very good Wednesday evening to you. You're watching Thames Television. This is your life, and this is Duxford Airfield in Cambridgeshire. Fifty years ago, this hurricane and its brave pilot were helping to win the Battle of Britain. Many of those planes were shot down. This one survived in one piece. Now, the pilot that we're going to meet soon was shot out of the sky, but he lived to tell the tale. He thinks he's coming here for a documentary about the golden anniversary of a special organization which is very exclusive. His, I think, is one of the most inspiring stories this program has ever told. He's on his way. I'll just hide myself away in this spitfire. And you're right, I am enjoying every moment of this. A slight case of false pretenses, I'm afraid. It's a different sort of television program we've got to hear for, because I'm here to say, Group Captain Tom Gleave, today, this is your life. What well, nothing to talk about. We're going to wing our way down to Teddington, to our studios, okay. and have what we hope will be a wizard show. That's very nice, I hope. Mm -hmm. where, where, where do you get all this stuff from, you know? The story about you? Yeah. My lips are sealed, I can tell you nothing. But there's a lot of friends who are willing to tell the story, believe me. Oh, I did know this. Well, Tom, this is your life, and as well as your wife, Beryl, your family and close friends, you were joined by representatives of the RAF Benevolent Fund and former colleagues and associates. Also here, more than 100 members of the Guinea Pig Club that is about to celebrate its 50th year. Now, James Sanderman Allen, as Guinea Pig Club Secretary, perhaps you can explain the qualifications for membership. With pleasure. There are three qualifications required. Firstly, you had to be a serving member of the Royal Air Force during the 39-45 war when you were injured. Secondly, you had to be boiled, mashed or fried. Boiled being very lightly burnt. Mashed being gunshot or other wounds that required plastic surgery. Fried being badly burnt, uh, to bring you a modern example, Simon Weston, who a lot of people will know. And finally, you had to go to the Queen Victoria Hospital, East Grinstead for repairs, which is the best burns and plastic surgery unit in this country, was and still is. Thank you. And of course you were called the guinea pigs because plastic surgeons under the inspiring leadership of the late Sir Archibald Mackindoe carried out pioneering plastic surgery that was to save hundreds of lives and revolutionise operation methods. A film made for television spotlights the courage of pilots like yourself and here is just a glimpse of what you have lived through. I wouldn't bother about a mirror for a bit if I were you. <laughs> but you're not me, are you? No, I'm not. And I'm very fortunate that I'm not. Or maybe you're very fortunate that I'm not. Because I'm going to try and make you better. Oh, that's a joke, chum. Have you seen my hand? It's not a joke, Mr. Fleming. It's a very serious business. And I discovered, Tom, that guinea pigs like yourself are true heroes. <laughs> 
the star of The Perfect Hero, Nigel Havers. Thank you. Nigel, you really got into that part. I, I, I did get into it. Um, and um, the more I worked, the more I was lost in admiration for, for all of you. And uh, I'd just like to thank, thank you and shake your hand. Thank you very much. For being so brilliant in the sky all those years thank ago. Thank you very much. You will never be forgotten. Thank you very much thank indeed. You. Thank you, Nigel Hayes. Well said. Well, Thomas Percy Gleave, CBE, this is your life, and it started in Liverpool on September the 6th, 1908. You're the second son of Arthur and Amy Gleave, and there are your three sisters, Amy, Olive, and Adeline. Now, Amy, as Tom's one surviving sister, do you recall why he wasn't too keen to work in the tannery? When I was a small boy, when he saw an aeroplane in the sky, he always wanted to fly. Well, you became a founder member of the Liverpool and Merseyside Flying Club, and in 1929, after having flying lessons paid for by your mother, you obtained a full aviator's licence. Here's the young airman. Love that jacket. <laughs> you want to take up flying full-time, but as we've heard, your father regards it as a dangerous pursuit, and he feels you should keep your feet firmly on the ground in the family business. Your spirit of adventure then takes you off to Canada, well, the flying bug had bitten so hard that you defy your father and decide to join the Canadian Air Force. Your father gives his blessing but insists you come home and join the Royal Air Force. Here is the young flying officer Gleave, soon after joining Number 1 Squadron at RAF Tangmere in 1931. You take time off from your RAF duties in 1933 to try to become the first man to fly non-stop from Britain to Ceylon. How did that record attempt end, Tom? I had to land in a tree. I was in a ravine. And, uh, uh, you, you can laugh. <laughs> but, uh, and I had the choice of crashing straight ahead, which would have been curtains, or picking a tree. So I picked a really huge tree, closed my eyes, and I faced up on the ground about a quarter of an hour later. Uh, in the fuselage, no wings, nothing else but me. And I got out. I was a bit bloody, but nothing much. And I got out, and... Uh, uh, a gang of dogs, or a herd of dogs, came along from the shepherd, about 20 of them. Cruel, beastly-looking things. And luckily he came along, called the dogs off, and said, come along and have some soup in his broken whatnot. So I went to his tent, and I had this soup, and he nearly killed me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, I, he had a mule with a back like that. And he put me on this mule and a little suitcase to put all my little belongings in. And I went down on this, and after about a mile, I couldn't stick it. So I put him on the mule and I walked. <laughs> and, uh, and I stayed there for three weeks. I was patched up. I wasn't badly hurt. And then my father sent me enough money to come back by train. And uh, it's amazing the number in the RAF who have come back by train, believe me. <laughs> and uh, that, was a, that was my story of my effort breaking and whatnot. Well, after that rather full experience, you, uh, <laughs> you return home and ironically take a flying instructor's course. You're stationed in Northern Ireland when in 1937 your son John is born, and then with war clouds gathering over Europe, you're posted to the staff of Fighter Command at Stanmore. Now, the last thing you want is a desk job, and in the early summer of 1940, you get the command of 253 Squadron at Curtin in Lindsay in Humberside. While waiting for your transfer, your squadron is summoned to Kenley for emergency combat duty and you get permission to tag along. That last night before you travelled to Kenley is still clear in the memory of a pilot who was in your squadron. He now lives in Australia, speaking to you from Safety Bay, Percy Greenwood. Oh, Percy, yes, bless Hello, him. Tom, my old friend. I suppose you remember as well as I do that last night we spent at Prestwick in Scotland when we got the news that we were going down to Kenley near Biggin Hill the next day. Little did we know that within a week, half the squadron w would have been gone. Uh, we'd have had three COs, yourself included, grievously burnt in hospital, and both flight commanders. But there, we're still alive, and I suppose as long as we're still alive, we'll remember them as they were, young fellows. Meanwhile, Tom, keep healthy, and I hope we'll see each other before too long. Bye-bye. Well done, Percy. Thank you, Percy Greenwood. On your first day of combat, you're credited with shooting down one and possibly four more enemy planes. 
The next day, August the 31st, 1940, your successor as commanding officer is shot down, and you again take command. After lunch that day, you lead your depleted squadron against a mass raid of German bombers. You're about to repel an attack by a bomber when your starboard wing is hit by a stray shot. A flame shoots along the wing. You rock and slow the aircraft in a bid to put out the fire, but suddenly the cockpit is engulfed in flames. Badly burned, you manage to drag open the cockpit cover and hurl yourself out at 7,000 feet. And Tom, tell us what happened after you landed. Well, um, I stood in this field looking like a Michelin man, you know what happens when you burn, and uh, I thought, oh, let's see a doctor. So I called out, anybody about, and uh, out of a cow shed nearby came a very stalwart man who insisted on putting me on his back and carrying me up to the house belonging to Mrs. Lewis. I regret, to my shame, I kept saying, you know, uh, uh, how much longer, that sort of thing, and eventually I got to the back of this hospital the Orp in Orpington. Well, let's not take the story too and, far. Uh, let's stay... you asked for the story, it yeah. goes on like that. Like, yeah. <laughs> but I've got loads of it in here. And you're, you're telling the whole thing single-handed. We'll, yeah. we'll have a little help along the way, Tom, because, as you said, once in that farmhouse, we'll take it back to there, the farmer's wife, Constance Wilson, tells the farmhand, as we've heard, to put you in the best bedroom. And all you kept doing was apologising. The farmer's son, whose late mother oh, looked after yes. you, Alec Wilson. Alec Wilson, is he here? Oh, oh. Alec, how nice to see you. Nice to see you. John, you're not coming yeah. out. Hello, Alec. So, uh, your mother did wonders for Tom, then, did she? Yes, my mother was a real angel. Tom was in a terrible state. But all he was worried about was making a mess on Mum's nice clean bed because of his injuries. This is a very brave man. Thank you. Alec Wilson. We've got proof there. <laughs> you were taken to hospital, first at Orpington, and then here to the Queen Victoria Hospital in East Grinstead, where Sir Archibald Mackendo was pioneering plastic surgery. And we're delighted to have Sir Archibald's widow, Lady Constance, with us here this evening. Now, Cyril Jones... Uh, you were head theatre technician while Tom was having all his operations. Yes, I was. And I well remember Tom because he was, uh, he was a little more mature to the other boys and therefore a very good patient. He, we've always said that his nose is a masterpiece. <laughs> <laughs> Probably the best one we've ever made. <laughs> <laughs> so, Beryl, what did he have to say for himself when you first saw him in hospital? I had a row with a German. But it's not all pain and anguish in the hospital. There are laughs as well, and a lot of hijinks. There was, for instance, the night of the collapsing bed. She was a ward sister at Queen Vic. Now, Mrs. Margaret Bucky, you knew her as Sister Gee. Mealy. We've got to come to his first one too. Next reunion. Margaret, wrestle free and uh, tell us... Uh, <laughs> tell us... talking. Yes, that's one word for it. Now, <laughs> would you tell us the story? Well, when he arrived at the hospital, there were several lay raids overhead and we very often had to get him on the beds to protect him. And as he got better, of course, he was billeted out, but occasionally he came back for treatment. And one evening, he said to me, would you like to come out and we'll have some supper? So I went with him. But when he came back to the ward, some of the wild lads there, the pilots, <laughs> had removed the mesh wire mattress off the bed and just left <laughs> the ordinary mattress on top. And as Tom got into bed, he fell right through. <laughs> Thank you very much. Margaret Bucky. See you later, dear. You are among a group of pilots who in 1941 form the Guinea Pig Club to help support and encourage fellow RAF Burns victims. So Archibald McIndoe becomes your first chief and by the end of World War II there are 649 of you. Exactly a year after your miraculous escape from the blazing hurricane, you are back flying again and you take command of RAF Manston. You stay in Bronsbury with a family where you again find three sisters who treat you like their brother. Their parents, Alec and Una Lee, were both opera singers and you enjoyed many a musical evening around the piano. As 46 years on, those sisters, Enid, Esme and Margaret, now recall at that very house. I love the moon. I love the sun. I love the forest, the flowers, the farm.
joy of the singing evenings when you were with us. And sometimes during the air raids, we had to go downstairs into the cellar and continue our singing song without the accompaniment. We shall always right. have a song in our heart for you, yes, Tom. Bye bye. 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 And two of those singing sisters are here with us this evening Enid and Margaret. You can stand anything. <laughs> that was marvellous singing. I, it was really, I loved it. <laughs> Lovely singing, Margaret. Thank you very much. We see you here, Tom, with your close friend, the late Henry Standen. Oh, it was Henry, Henry yeah. and his wife Anne who were the organising force behind the guinea pigs, and it was Henry who proposed you for the role of chief pig following the death of Sir Archibald in 1960. You take over in what is a moment of crisis for the club, and astonishingly, it is this 1960 derby victory by St Paddy with Leicester Pickett aboard that proves the turning point in the club's fortunes, as Lady Evelyn Sassoon, the widow of St Paddy's owner, now recalls. It's a pleasure to be able to participate in this great honour that has been given to you. I'm sure you remember the concern that I that was had at the time of Archie's death about the re future reunions. And one day at a luncheon, we spoke about this with Connie, Lady McIndoo, and Victor said, don't worry, you know, St. Patty won the Derby, and I will see that he hosts your 1960 reunion, your weekend at East Grinstead. And with that, Victor Sassoon, had a huge portrait made of St. Patty, which was placed at the head of the table for your stag dinner. I'm only sorry that I can't be with you tonight, but you'll know that you're in my thoughts, and I look forward to the, the 50th reunion next year. God willing, I'll be with you. Good old bombs here. Thank yeah. you, ladies and gentlemen. Now, well, Angela, what keeps your father occupied these days, apart from his work for the guinea pigs? Well, he never really thinks he's too old to learn. He does all his work on a computer nowadays. He's very fond of all his family, and especially his grandchildren, Rupert and Thomas. And his granddaughter, Sophie, has been working abroad this year. Yes, Sophie works in Corfu, doesn't she? But I'm not in Corfu tonight, Grandad. I would not have missed your special night for the world. She has flown in today, your granddaughter, Sophie. Light of my life. <laughs> In the winter of 1967, Tom, comes a stark reminder of your dice with death during the Battle of Britain when parts of your wrecked hurricane are dug up in a field one and a half miles from Biggin Hill. Now, when you were parachuting down, you threw away a certain piece of RAF equipment. Can you recall what it was? When the first, the Hornet came out, that was the name of the first Fury. It was sent to Tangmere to be diced with, it was, it was Siskin. We flew Siskins in those days, long before you were born. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> the chap flying the Siskin on this particular test crashed into the Hornet. The Hornet got away with it, but Siskin didn't, and he bailed out. Three months later, when I'd arrived at Tangmere, I remember he's outside the flight office and the stores officer, as he was called in those days, now his equipment officer, came along on those books, two feet square and about six pieces of carbon, and said, uh, Davis, would you please sign there, here, and give me two and sixpence? So he said, why, with a few uh, adjectives. And uh, he said, well, you're supposed to bring it back with you, and they cost the Air Force two and sixpence. Well, I was coming down in this parachute, gradually becoming like a Michelin man, and I was holding this ruddy thing in my hand, and I thought of that, and I said something very disgusting, and I threw it as far as I could see it, and I can see it now going down like a tadpole all the way down. <laughs> That's the story of the uh, parachute release grip. Well, that was worth, what, 12 and a half P now, and we have another surprise for you tonight. Yes, Tom, now you won't have to pay that two and six penny fine. Here with some good news for you is David Porter. Oh, David, yes. 
Now, David, you've, you've carried out many searches for wrecked wartime aircraft, haven't you? Yes, I've carried out quite a few, Michael. But one in particular took place in 1967, which Tom well knows about. And we did, in actual fact, eventually find this hurricane. And after quite a bit of research and some very interesting parts that we found, we were able to establish that it was Tom's hurricane. And uh, after that, Tom, we have continued to look for other items. And the reason why you won't have to pay your two and sixpence is that out of a hedgerow, some two years Did ago... Did you really? I don't believe yeah. it. <laughs> I do promise this, isn't it? Yes, your release. Oh, Parachute yeah. release handle. Poor thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Thank, Thank you, Tom. I don't believe it. I just wonder what you'll use it for now, Tom. <laughs> well, now, the, uh, Something good, isn't it? the big event each year for the guinea pigs is the annual reunion. The next will be the 50th. During the reunion dinner 11 years ago, your speeches received even more warmly than usual. Your audience was delighted. As guinea pigs, we all appreciated your blazing performance. He's one of the youngest guinea pigs, Jack Perry. Oh, Jack, yeah. yeah. Me, I don't know. I'm working on that thing, Coyle. Oh, me, I don't know. Yeah. So, Jack. Oh, he's the cameo kiss. All right. <laughs> this is all part of the guinea pig thing. Oh, I see. Yeah. <laughs> could, could be worse. Now, Jack, that, that was a dramatic moment. It was indeed. Tom was um, speaking, and they had his notes and was talking away <laughs> very, very nicely, very formally. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of a sudden, his um, notes started going up in flames because they were dipping into a candle, <laughs> which was on the table in front of him. He's um, the most generous and warm-hearted guinea pig, and uh, he's so efficient, it's unbelievable. Tom, we all love you dearly. Thank we you, Jack Perry. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. <laughs> now, the ordeals through which you and your fellow guinea pigs pushed yourselves worked wonders in helping to advance medical science, particularly in the field of plastic surgery. More than 40 years after your experience, a young man lay in a London hospital using the legend of the guinea pigs as motivation to overcome dreadful injuries that he had received while serving in the Falklands conflict. And tonight, oh, Tom, yes. I'd like to pay my little tribute to you and your fellow pigs. Here from his home in Wales, former Welsh guardsman, Simon West. Is he? Is he? Oh, Simon. <laughs> Simon, you know all about the guinea pigs, don't you? Yes, I do indeed. Yeah. They won't have a greater hero worshipper than myself. Um, it's due to their great courage and their determination that, um, and the stories that I heard. I met Tom first, and uh, he won't remember this, but um, I always mentioned the fact that I noticed that he'd had the, the divot on the, on the forehead. And they actually made his nose from that, and it gave me great encouragement, because I had problems with my nose. Although mine came from my backside there. <laughs> I do admire yours a great deal more than my own. <laughs> Tom, it gives me great pleasure to say that, uh, and I've never been prouder to say this, I've never met more of a pig of a man. <laughs> Tom Glee, this is your life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.